Thank you, Dr. Monroe, for the introduction. A few other pieces of information to know about me that will maybe make some of this make more sense. Uh, while I was at CU Denver, I taught for several years in the community leadership uh, training programs that CU Denver ran, Denver Community Leadership Forum and the Rocky Mountain Leadership Program. And even though I grew up in Uray, it was participating in the huge uh, expeditionary learning components of the leadership training that I was doing that really got me interested in wilderness uh, backpacking and hiking. And um, I, I, true confession, I did not appreciate that I grew up in Uray and had the most beautiful backyard in the world. So it took me moving to Denver and uh, teaching at CU Denver to um, learn how to learn how to appreciate it. Um, it also gave me new appreciation for environmental ethics and wilderness philosophies and uh, concepts of preparing for a true expedition. More about that later. Uh, I am a Midwesterner at heart. I was born near Peoria, Illinois. Uh, there's a reason why the saying is how it plays in Peoria. Um, I truly believe in good conversations, even if they always start out with talking about the weather, which they often do if you're from the Midwest. And I also believe that most problems can be solved by having a communal meal together. Very Midwestern uh, philosophies. I care deeply about my small town roots. I moved to URA when I was seven. Uh, one of my teachers from high school, Mr. F, you'll see him in some of the pictures, uh, went with me on two of my three expeditions. And that means, uh, that means the world to me that somebody that I knew 35 years ago and had that kind of foundation with, got, we got to do this part of uh, our lives together. So um, finally, I am a first generation college student. Uh, both of my parents were the first people in their families to graduate from high school. So I truly, truly appreciate the opportunities that I have because I participated in higher education and now work in higher education. So uh, the issues that are important to me about accessibility and access to higher education come from that perspective. So why are we doing these talks? I know you're sitting there thinking, this could not be more different than Dr. Ward's talk. Well, what I understand we were, uh, what this is all about is for us to get outside of our job descriptions and understand what makes us all tick. And I'm certainly getting to hear about Dr. Ward and the other research, you'll understand foundations um, academically of what uh, lies behind what people bring into the classroom. And I hope that this will uh, help you understand what I bring in to my position. So this is just, uh, I have over 5,000 pictures from my three trips. It's really hard to distill it down. So I just have a few random slides going over here. Maybe, we're not sure if we got it set up right. All right, um, also fundamentally I care about inclusion and appreciating and protecting the outdoors and how public policy decisions impact both of those. Um, my academic background has been a foundation and how these passions have played out. Uh, I studied coalition building for the passage of the American Disabilities Act, and then I had a family. More about that later. Uh, my intentions for this talk and what I hope you'll take away, um, I hope that you'll figure out what story you have to tell, and next time Kimberly sends out the so who wants to go next, you will all say, I was inspired, and I know what I want to talk about. So uh, there's that and um, hopefully a different understanding of a little bit about what it's like to live with a disability and what inclusion means. All right, so why my title? Uh, why thrice in a lifetime? Every time somebody asks me, why would you do this? Why would you uh, go on a river for 17 days, 21 days, have zero contact with the outside world, do every possible, uh, every possible uh, act of daily living outside for that long, um, I say, well, I, I have to, you know, it, yeah, I dropped everything once with six days notice to go do this. Why? Because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And then I caught myself saying that when the second one was coming up because I already got to do it once. So I've always been a little bit of an overachiever. So that's why I call it my thrice in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I sometimes think things have to happen to me a few more times than the average bear for me to learn everything I was supposed to learn. So 
but I do know I'm lucky, and I also would do it again if I got the opportunity. And then I'll have to change the name. All right, so I, I'm mixing up my order a little bit. I'm going tradition, expedition, and inclusion. I hope you can all roll with it. I know you walked in very set on my title, but I think you can all handle it. So starting with tradition. Oh, and just I am, I brought a couple of, um, I brought three river maps. If they look um, dirty and uh, most of them I have not opened since our last trip, um, but they're waterproof pages. So that is what a river guide looks like. If you've never done a river trip, this is the Bible that gets you down the river and tells you where everything is. And then I brought um, the red notebook that uh, Lynn, Lynette is holding. Um, that is what I made for each of the boats on my second trip. And then the photo books, um, I think Jaime is looking at those. So you're welcome to pass those around. All right, so um, I wanna start with a land acknowledgement. Um, we're talking about the Grand Canyon today. And it's a natural wonder, wonder that was created by a river cutting through the earth for over six million years. The river, the canyon, and the land surrounding it have evidence of being lived in by people for over 13,000 years. There are 11 contemporary native tribes with connections to this land, and I'm always profoundly aware of their presence and legacy while I'm on the river, and I want to bring awareness to them today while we talk about their land. The Grand Canyon covers over 1,900 square miles. The state of Rhode Island is only 1,200 square miles, just to give you perspective. It is substantially larger, just the Grand Canyon, substantially larger than the entire state of Rhode Island. Uh, it's been a protected land since the early 19th century. Thank you, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and it became a national park in 2019. That's not right, in 1919, because we just celebrated 100 years. All right, there's over 450 species of birds, including the endangered California condor, which I've been lucky enough to see three of, um, 91 different species of mammals, 18 species of fish, and likely two scorpion species, but that's an entirely different talk. We do not have time for that today. No, no time for that. <laughs> we'll talk about it at lunch. <laughs> All right, it's a geologist's dream. Being in the Grand Canyon, from the Kaibab limestone layer at the top to the Ninka Wheat Foundation at the bottom, I've spent a significant amount of my life arguing with my boatmates about what is your favorite rock layer. That is a thing. Um, everyone has their favorite layer. For me, it's the Vishnu Schist. Can't get enough of it. Um, I took a lot of pictures of rocks. I think my pictures aren't going, but you would see I take a lot of pictures of rocks. They're, the variety and at how different they are every single day is unbelievable. Um, the great unconformity uh, is my favorite. Does anybody know what the great unconformity is? You know what the great unconformity is? All right, so the great unconformity is a mysterious layer where there's about a billion years of the geological record that is missing. So. The layer that's on top and the layer that's on the bottom, usually there's a, a billion years of rocks in between that. But because of how the um, rock is vaulted and how it has been eroded through the years, you can literally touch a billion years of geology at one time. Um, it, it, it's a very profound place to be in Blacktail Canyon. Um, and then this is my son Everett, my stepson Frederick, and my husband uh, in that cat amoeba climbing up the waterfall. Um, more about this later, Everett made it, I did not. All right, um, okay, so moving on to expedition. An expedition is a journey or a voyage taken on by a group of people with a particular purpose. Um, exploring the Grand Canyon from the bottom can only be done as an expedition. Um, there, how many people do you think visit the Grand Canyon every year? Six million. So it, it's one of the most visited state uh, national parks, but it's not the most uh, visited. Anybody know what the most visited one? No? No? Yes. Say it again. Great Smoky Mountains back east, which, I don't know, I was really surprised when I heard that fun fact. Um, 
So how do you get to be in the position of being the less than 1% of the 6 million visitors that sees the canyon from the bottom each year? Because more than 90% of the people who visit the Grand Canyon in any given year never get further than 100 yards away from their car. Think about that. This is an area that's larger than the state of Rhode Island. 90% of the people who go and visit don't get further than 100 yards away from their own vehicle that they came there in. So how do you get a, how do you get a permit? The permit process starts a, a more than a year before. So we just finished the permit process for the 2024 year, calendar year for the Grand Canyon. We did not get a permit for 2024. So now we are keeping our eye out for follow-up lotteries. About 8% of people who apply for a private permit um, get, get selected to go. Um, and it's about 5,000 people, 5,000 launch permits, private permits a year. Um, there's about 25,000 total boaters that go down, but there's four times as many commercial boaters that go down as the private boaters. And there's lots of regulations about whether you can have a motor um, between April and October, you can have a motor. And um, between October or, or, you know, November to March, October to March, you can only um, get down with rowing or paddling. So it definitely changes your experience what time of the year you go. So um, I was part of applying for a permit the first time um, in, it would have been February of 2019. Uh, my son had literally just turned 18. Um, so I took advantage of his newfound adultness and said, hey, you want to go in the Grand Canyon? He said, sure, because he was in Brazil and disoriented and would say yes to anything at that point. So I signed him up, and he won the golden ticket the first time around. None of us could believe it. So he pulled a permit to launch June 3rd, 2020. So we immediately called the outfitter. We reserved boats. We only had an eight-person uh, permit. You pull either a small launch or a large launch, and we had a small launch, so only eight people. And when you are rowing your people and everything that you need to survive anything for the next 17, 18 days, the most important people in those boats are people who know how to row and people who have had experience on the river. So when you only have eight people, you have to think very carefully about who those eight people are. Henry knew nothing about being on a river. So our trip leader was basically worthless. And he would agree with me now that if he, if we had gone when we were originally supposed to go in 2020, it would have been a disaster. So um, thank you, coronavirus, for uh, making our permit get canceled. So we started planning in February, I guess it was March, 1st of March um, in 2019, five weeks before we were supposed to launch, the National Park Service uh, canceled all river permits because of corona. They had, they had initially done a shutdown, but they had said they might start up again June 1st, so we were waiting to see what would happen. Five weeks before we went, they made the decision that all permits were delayed for two years. Because of the way the permit system works, they couldn't give us the next year because those spots had already been filled up. So we were guaranteed the spot to launch on June 3rd, 2022, which we did. And Henry matured fabulously in those two years in the meantime, and it worked out really well. So um, that is my, uh, oh, wrong computer. So uh, this is my first trip. The way we got our first permit is when the park decided to go ahead and open up, uh, I think they decided I think they decided that August 1st of 2020, they were going to issue some permits. So literally an email was sent out to everybody who had applied for a permit in 2020 that said, we're opening up permits. And if you want to go, there's 12 spots opening up. Oh, by the way, they start four days from now, which is insane. I mean, it really is insane. So we had already been planning our trip. We, 
I had already made my packing list. So what could go wrong? So we uh, woke up the morning of July 31st, and um, it was first call, first serve. So uh, my now husband and now stepson, we all got on the phone and just dialed the park ranger's office. Um, I'm the one who finally got a pickup, and I said, do you still have permits? And he said, it's your lucky day. So we got a permit that launched on August 6th. Six days later, uh, so we were in La Junta with nothing ready to go. Six days from now, 17-day uh, wilderness rafting experience um, with eight people that could go. So who are the crazy eight people that said yes? Well, we only found six. So um, my husband, Niels, he had done four previous trips. Obviously, he's the, uh, the brains behind all of this or the one who's crazy enough to keep doing it. Myself, uh, Frederick is Neil's son, who was 17 at the time. And then there's Everett, who was 14 at the time. Um, and then Ron and Hannah, uh, friends of mine from Denver. Ron grew up, his family owned the rafting business in Glenwood Springs, so he grew up rafting. You can't just ask anybody, hey, can you row a boat down the Grand Canyon? Ron was a retiring, um, from Wheat Ridge High School as a high school science teacher. And he was like, great, this will be my retirement party. What meals do you need me to make? So Ron ran to the grocery store and bought enough food to make six nights worth of frozen meals. I ran to Walmart and got enough stuff. I made 100 breakfast burritos and immediately put them in the freezer, marked in little bags, day one, day two, day three, with six little burritos in each bag, put them in the deep freeze, and uh, – yeah, so we scrambled. Um, Niels had an infected tooth. He went ahead and went to the dentist, had it pulled, because you can't really go on the Grand Canyon with a tooth that you're not sure is what, what's going to happen, because it's kind of a big deal to be medically evacuated from the Grand Canyon. That's a different talk. <laughs> All right, so that was, that was my first trip. The second trip... Uh, in a follow-up lottery, so as people, things get more realistic and they, they have received a permit but they know they can't go, uh, they open up follow-up lotteries. And you have just a couple of days to, uh, it, literally 48 hours to say, sure, I'll go on that date. So in July of 2021, um, Niels put in October 16th was one of the dates. And he had always said if he could ever go on a trip October 15th, would be the ultimate date to go, just because of the weather. It was 120 degrees. It broke heat records our first trip, so going when it was a little cooler sounded like a great idea. You could also go longer. Um, we did a 22-day trip, our second trip. Um, so we knew about it uh, further ahead of time. We had a 16-person permit, easily filled up. It was uh, people, people definitely were excited about this trip. Um, so this is us, our group, uh, launching uh, on October 16th in 2021. And then my thrice in a lifetime trip, we went on the original, uh, this is the original permit. Uh, Henry in the blue shirt in the back was our trip leader. He was ready. He'd been to Boulder for a couple of years. He was a, a vegetarian, made meal planning very interesting. So, you know, it was all good. Um, one thing we did every night, we would have a TED Talk. We all came prepared with a topic to talk about. <laughs> and Henry spent the night convince, trying to convince us all that we should be vegetarian. And it was classic, and we all um, quote him often on his, on his uh, imploring of us. So, um, basics of river expeditions. Uh, the river is 280 miles. Um, there's over 80 significant rapids. Who's rafted before? So if you've rafted before, unless you've been on the Grand Canyon, the rapids were rated one to five. Five is the biggest, most impending wave. The water is so big on the Grand Canyon, it has its own scale. It's one to 10 on the Grand Canyon. 80, um, 80 of those rapids fall between one and nine. There's not a 10 yet. Um, and 10 of those are arguably considered to be very significant rapids. Um, I would say 
all of them, all 80 can flip a raft. Like if you, if you've been rafting, you know, like it's up to the river. It's not up to you. Um, what happens? You can do your best. I've never flipped. I, I've fallen out twice, but I've never flipped. Um, all right. So, uh, 80 named rapids, uh, going from one to 10. And another basic of, uh, river expeditions is food. You pack everything you need. You get giant coolers. Um, two of our trips, we packed all of our own food. So we did work with a, um, outfitter to do the boats and the frames and the oars and, um, some of the other, like the, the satellite phone and just some of the equipment. And then they also froze huge coolers a third of the way full with water, deep, deep frozen for, you know, hopefully a couple of weeks. So that ice was really cold and really solid. And then it's a scramble. You bring your coolers and it's this mad dash to move it from the coolers you brought it in to the coolers you're putting it in because some of these, the food has to last the, uh, for 22 days on our October trip. Um, interesting fact, you've probably all heard that Lake Mead is draining, Lake Powell is draining. There's not enough water to sustain the Grand Canyon. I might get emotional. Another reason why I'm really lucky is I'm not sure future generations are going to be able to do this. Uh, the uh, era of running the Colorado River might be coming to a close. We saw an eight degree temperature difference in two summers because of the water, the difference of the water level coming out of Lake Powell. The water was heating up that quickly. It affects the fish, it affects the plants, it affects everything about the river, including the people who are boating on top of it. So it affected our food because our coolers, the first time we went, uh, we, we got out after 17 days and had chunks of ice in our cooler that we, you know, threw out on the beach. Um, we, we had zero ice on our, um, our third trip, our third trip in June of 2022. Um, and, and so those are some very significant changes that you're seeing and what it's like to run a river. So everything is labeled. Uh, you have, you have everything in, Plastic bags, sealed in bags. You do a lot of uh, meals ahead of time. I love cooking, and I love the look of delight and absolute thinking I'm crazy when I'm like, tonight we're having Moroccan tagine lamb meatballs. And people are like, why? And I'm like, because we can. So you plan your menus, and um, you freeze the bags, and uh, everything is labeled out. There's a, a system. So you arrive at Lee's Ferry on put-in day, and you spend six to eight hours in the hot sun uh, loading up your raft. We had hot sun. If it's pouring rain, it doesn't matter. You still have to do it. You don't get to wait till the next day. It's very specific when you can go. So this is just, uh, this is just uh, basically, that's just the soft drinks for one trip. Um, that, that's not, that, that's our first trip. That's just the soft drinks. That's not even, that's not even really the food. I mean, you can imagine, you can imagine what it's like. The shopping lists were incredible. No, no, you, every, you break it up. Like, uh, one raft gets to have the bread box and all of the, um, bread for every, you know, goes in one of the captain's boxes in the raft. Um, somebody else will have the kitchen, which is the box that has all the pots, the pans, um, the plates, the, um, all the utensils. So the, that, that's part of the expedition is figuring out how many people you have, how many rafts you're going to have. My first trip had two rafts. My second trip had five rafts. My third trip had three rafts. Obviously, more rafts makes it easier. Um, Niels did a trip with one raft and four people because he had two kayakers, two friends that were kayakers. And so he had to support the entire trip from, from one raft. So, yeah, I, and we, we, there's a lot of math that's involved. Oh, Gary. Oh, no, Gary's there. Gary, this is the part you would love. The math, getting ready to go. Like, you literally figure out how much cans weigh and how much space they take up. You divide it by the number of people going and say, 
you get to pick 37 cans of whatever you want, but you only get 37 cans. And then you have to think, okay. Yes. Leave no trace. That is a principle that I am coming up to next. Leave no trace. Uh, literally the next thing on my list. It's like Debbie's trying to move me along. Um, everything that goes in must go out. Everything that goes in must go out. That includes poop. So uh, time-honored river tradition is the Groover, so named because ammo boxes, um, because they are watertight, um, are used to pack in and out everything. Um, the ammo boxes that are used for the uh, restrooming part of the trip are painted bright yellow, so you make no mistakes about which uh, ammo can you're getting into. One of the boats is the Groover boat. You don't have the food and the Groovers on the same boat in the best situation. So um, we'll get to this when we talk about Everett. Everett has uh, some very... Um, specific needs and uh, using the Groover for more time than average uh, was something he had to do every day. So he generally set up on the edge of a cliff, waved at people as they went by, because why not make the best of a situation when you can't do anything about it? So, um, food, uh, let's see. This is a typical camp. This is the kitchen where the, um, all of the stoves are set up. You can see different campsites. Um, this is from our trip in 2020. Uh, this night was literally the only night that I set up a tent. The, we, we just slept outside the rest of it. Um, it seemed like it was getting windy and maybe rainy, so we set up a tent. I literally never got in a tent the entire first trip. And I think altogether I've maybe spent six nights out of 54 nights on the river six nights in a tent. I highly recommend sleeping outside on the Grand Canyon. So, oh, I just want to call out, I believe Melanie is also a one percenter who has spent the night at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, but she hiked down to the bottom and then hiked up on her honeymoon. It's a pretty hilarious story. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, like I said, um, meals, like preparing the meals, is one of the most fun parts of the trip. In my opinion, you can see this was a, a layover day where I was cleaning out leftovers, and I was like, okay, so we'll have some tuna salad. I have some cucumber. So that was our appetizer for the day. Uh, this was a fresh rice salad. I took a picture because I thought it was colorful. So um, you, you do everything. You filter the water as you go. Uh, you don't take all your water with you. You filter it as you go. Um, let's see. We would row usually 12 to 15 miles a day. It would kind of depend. If it was super, super windy, sometimes you can only go six or seven miles. Um, sometimes you go longer and then you have a layover day. There's nothing more delightful than waking up and knowing you don't have to pack everything up. You can leave it where it is, enjoy the day, wash your hair, do whatever you want and you don't have to set up camp again at the end of the day. The thing about rafting, if you like camping, that's one thing, but rafting is continuously breaking down and setting up your camp. So you have to really love it to, uh, to do that. All right, so that's the end of expedition. On to inclusion. So the last piece of the get to know Maureen trivia is that I am a mother. Um, I always wanted to be a mom. I thought I wanted to have three kids. Um, I already said I'm an overachiever. Um, the universe had other ideas of how many kids I should have. So uh, my oldest, Henry, is 22 now. Harper will be 20 in a few days. And then I have twins. So the twins pushed me right over the edge into crazy people territory. And now I have a stepson as well, Frederick, who is 20. So when I was going to grad school with my two oldest kids, Henry and Harper, they were little, little. Um, studying disability policy became my policy interest. I was in a public administration program, and I was fascinated by the coalitions built about around passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a unique 
uh, bipartisan piece of legislation. Uh, I, I've always been interested in politics, but this just really sparked me as a unique policy area. Um, again, the universe decided that uh, things wouldn't go necessarily like I thought. And so my academic experience and interest in disability uh, changed when my son Everett was born. He was diagnosed with spina bifida before he was even born. Um, we were told lots of things about what that would mean. Uh, the things that stuck in my head were that he would uh, need a wheelchair, take it around, and uh, that he would have to catheterize the whole, his whole life. And I just got stuck there for a while and thought, oh, this is going to change everything. But then Everett was born, and uh, he has not slowed down since he was born. So um, my academic interest in access, inclusion, and disability policy shifted to advocacy and lived experience. Um, before Everett turned six years old, he had 19 surgeries. He's used a wheelchair for mobility since he was 14 months old. I know more about neurosurgery, insurance policies, and healthcare quality and safety standards than I ever wanted to know. Uh, here's a takeaway. Sometimes expertise is thrust upon you and not chosen. Uh, when Everett was five years old, my oldest daughter, who was eight years old at the time, was diagnosed with bipolar mood disorder. Uh, less than 1% of people who live with bipolar uh, are diagnosed this young and have symptoms that young. Um, I quickly learned that advocating for seen disabilities and unseen disabilities is a definite game changer. So Everett was my bridge from academic to advocacy, but he really was just getting me started. Um, when your family goes to a restaurant and you have a 10, five-year-old, 10-year-old in a wheelchair, everybody smiles, everybody opens doors. When you have a, the same age child having a psychotic break in a restaurant, you do not get the same understanding and support from your community. So inclusion goes beyond building ramps and stamping braille onto our signage. It means embracing that people tick differently in both seen and unseen ways. So that is, uh, that is something that my life has taught me. Um, what does this have to do with the Grand Canyon, you ask? Well, when the possibility of going on a Grand Canyon expedition for the first time came up, I knew immediately we needed to take Everett. Everett loves camping. Everett loves being outside, doing all things. Um, everything that he, uh, everything that we have to think of an interesting way to do it, Everett wants to do it. Um, when he got off the Grand Canyon, he told me, I think I want to be, I want to be a raft guide when I grow up. And I thought, of course you do, Everett. Of course you do. That's awesome. Um, I also knew Everett, uh, let's see, so Everett was 11, 12. He was 12 at the time when we got the first permit, and he's a big kid if you've seen him. He was littler then, and I knew that, like, being, it, like, you can't take a wheelchair on the Grand Canyon, so there would be a lot of helping Everett get around, and I knew that he's only going to get bigger, and taking a smaller child on a trip like this had its advantages to him getting bigger. So we were like, okay, it's now or never. Let's do this. We knew he wanted to go. We knew it was optimizing when he could go. Um, we left the wheelchair. This is his last picture in the wheelchair. He was having his moment saying goodbye to his, uh, his freedom and mobility. And he got out his crutches and uh, did a lot of crutching. He crutched up side canyons. If anybody knows what Elf's Chasm is, it's a very popular side hike. It's about uh, three quarters of a mile up, straight up a canyon. Everett's been up there twice. He got to the top of the waterfall. We all decided with Everett's voice being primary that it was not a good idea for him to jump off because we couldn't figure out how to shove him out far enough that there was no way his head wouldn't hit. So he climbed back down. We found a different cliff to throw him off a few days later. So. Um, he, nothing stops him. You can see this is a very steep, uh, a steep bank. He, he figured out how to do the Grand Canyon. Uh, so rigging to flip. This is a concept that rafters know. When you get in your boat, every, every time before you take off 
from the land, you make sure you're rigged to flip. That means that everything that can be tied down is tied down. Your water bottles, like the map, one of the maps has a carabiner on it. Everything is locked in, tied in. Nothing is left dangling. You don't leave your hat, your jacket. Everything is either tied to you or tied to the raft. So um, this idea that whenever you push off, you're completely prepared for every situation, of course, it's ideal, but it's also not going to solve every problem. And I feel that's a little bit what it's like to be Everett's mom. I feel like I rigged a flip every day, and then we get out in the rapid and we see what happens. And we hope we don't flip over and have to find out if we got every single strap tied down. So, um, here's some more pictures. This is Everett. Uh, climb, he's up on the top of the waterfall. This is while we're still making the decision whether or not he should jump off. In the middle, he's, he, he didn't jump that time. He jumped a different cliff. Um, the middle is him and Matt Cat. And then the, this one on the left is him starting up. Um, we, we got smart. The second trip, we took knee pads. We didn't take knee pads the first time. And knee pads made a huge difference because there was a lot of crawling and scrambling, and uh, his knees looked a lot better after, after our second trip. I think this will always be my favorite picture of Everett. This is at Havasu. Uh, he had hiked up um, part of the river and with his crutches, and you can see he wears his braces. He doesn't have feeling in his feet, so even if he's not walking, he still has to protect his feet because if he steps on a rock or gets cut, he won't feel it or notice it. So his feet have to stay protected um, the whole time. You know what's good if you have really good upper body strength? Rowing. Everett is a very, very, very good rower. And I know I said this was for the next talk, but when we were down one oarsman for our last day, uh, last time, Everett rowed me out the last 10 miles, and we went through... Um, six named rapids. One of them was a six, and he didn't even flinch. And um, when we pulled up to the takeout, the other one of the other groups that was there said it best. Came over, said, "What is your name?" You know, and here's Everett, and said, "I'm Everett," and he says, "Everett, you are a badass." <laughs> so this is uh, this is Everett demonstrating that. So. Um, I have a conclusion, but I thought I would stop now for Q&A. Um, it is. Um, I, it takes a few days, but I would say it takes six or seven days. I don't think you can do a trip. Like, I don't think you can accomplish the same things in a trip that only lasts four, five, six days that you can do on a 17 or 22 day trip where you are completely unplugged and living uh, where the most important thing is that you get up, you make sure you leave no trace, that you are leaving your campground or your campsite uh, cleaner than you found it, and then your next goal is to survive to lunch and then you enjoy lunch, and then your next goal is to find a campsite for that night, and your next goal is to stay dry and stay warm and stay in community with the people that you're with. And to me, it's, it's a gift. And this is a screenshot from my phone. Um, my iPhone hadn't been backed up in two weeks, and I think that's magnificent. I, I, the only reason I had it with me is it was also my camera. I took all my pictures on my iPhone. Um, so, I, to me, I feel like this is an accomplishment that I have done uh, two years of my life, or two weeks of my life, three times, plus the, third, the second trip was 22 days, so three weeks without, um, without connection. So it's, it's that ability to unplug. It, it's difficult to do in our, how we live now. I mean, we barely could make it. Like if I said, everybody, don't look at your phone until after dinner tonight. Like how many of you just got like heart palpitations at the thought of that? Like it, it, we were so tied in to, and this, this forces you to 
appreciate the rocks, the clouds, the sky, the water. And, you know, just hearing the water 24-7 is it's amazing. So, yeah, I hope I, I hope I get to do other rivers, but I would do this river again in a second. So. Other questions? Yeah, so the first trip and the second trip, we did all 280 miles. So the first time we did a night float out, because you get to a spot where there aren't any more rapids. The last, the last 20 miles after Separation Canyon, it's, it's pretty flat water. So we did it in the dark. Um, basically, we um, hitched the two rafts together and then just floated out. Um, it was a little scary because we got to some points where there were a lot of sandbars that hadn't been there when Niels had done this previously. And so when we did it the next year, we didn't do a night float. We rode out. And I'm not kidding. I think it was some of the most beautiful views. And I had just assumed, because it was dark, we weren't missing anything. So the book from the second trip that's back there on that table, um, this cover photo is from probably mile 270. And I just, I think it's a crime that I missed it in the middle of the night last time, or you know, the first time I went. Um, the third time we went, thank God, we had planned to get out at um, Diamond Creek, which is at mile 255. So we didn't go the toll 280 our last trip, because that's the first place in the canyon that vehicles can come down to. They go through the Wallapai uh, Reservation, and you get special access from the Wallapai Tribe. And um, we had vehicles that we had planned ahead of time that they were going to meet us there. And um, we, we, did, we had a crew member down. So we were, we were glad that we didn't have uh, another two days to go. So, But yes, you do the whole 280 miles. There's no... There's no three day, three day Grand Canyon trip. So, Gary, nope, oh, Gary's just stretching. Okay, for the, for the rec recording, let it be noted, Gary's just stretching. All right. <laughs> All right, so my conclusions, uh, my favorite part was unplugging. That's this slide. Um, I do think that what I did was unusual. I don't think it was extraordinary. I think we all have adventures like this that we could share. Uh, I think I'm lucky, and I think it was unusual, but I don't, I don't think what I did was any, uh, anything more than stories that other people have. But I think living with disability is also unusual, but it's not extraordinary. And if we reframe the lens that we see disability and just think, how, how, how do you do it instead of how do you say no? Like, one of, one of the hang-ups I had about taking over it is this... Um, one of his routines that he does every day, he needs to have a thousand uh, cubic centimeters of um, uh, sterile saline water mixed with a certain amount of glycerol and a certain amount of Castile, and then it has to. And, and I was like, okay, I'm going to have to pack like 18 days worth. And then when all of a sudden it was like, no, you have three days to figure this out, I was like, I can sterilize water every day for the next day and just have one day supply. So like when you are forced to think about how, how do you make this easier, how do you make it doable, it can be done. If you, if, you, if you are forced to think about how do you make this inclusive and not merely just like, let's accommodate, let's make it happen, but how do you make it inclusive? Um, I hope that other staff, faculty, and students will share their journeys and expeditions with all of us. Uh, I want to leave you with a Teddy Roosevelt quote. Uh, his thoughts on the Grand Canyon. Remember this. Next time you hear developers talking about it, leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. Period. So, thank you for letting you, me show you my vacation slides.
our next task will be what we call seven, so it's on Corvus or Twitter, um, and that is titled Fossil Sequences from Prehistoric Phenodon, Paleontological Survey in Southeast Colorado. So we hope you'll continue to attend these. Thanks. Thank you for coming. I appreciate each and every one of you.